Today we are looking at the principles of the kingdom of God. The principles of the kingdom of God. This is still part of our series, Kingdom Perspective, Life and Mysteries. What is a principle? A principle is simply a fundamental truth that governs or influences the thinking pattern, the belief system, or a way of behaving in people or groups of people. When you say something is a principle, it is universal. Even though certain people may reject it, it does not affect it. It is something that is fundamental and true. And also, there is always a moral authority behind what is known as a principle. For it to be actually truly a principle, there has to be a moral authority behind it. Now, when we're talking about the principles of the kingdom of God, the moral authority behind this fundamental truth is God himself. And that makes it move beyond just being a principle to being a law. Because God is a God of justice. And whatever it is that he stands behind is something that you can bank on, you can take to the market. It's something that has application universally. It does not matter whether you are black or white, male or female. The principles of the kingdom of God applies to you the same way it will apply unto others. And that is why we can trust it and depend on it and run with it so that we can get the results that are attached to these principles. Now, when you look at the kingdom of God, there are a number of principles that are fundamental in the things that we do. But I'm going to be looking at majorly three today because of the brevity of time. The purpose of this teaching is to open your mind to see the way these principles are in the Word of God so that when you come across any other one, you will be able to trust it and then work with it to bring out the kind of result that God wants you to get from such. The principles that we're going to be looking at today are first the principle of times and seasons. Then we have the principle of sowing and reaping. And lastly, the principle of the purpose and the anointing. As I explain in the course of this teaching, you will understand why these things are fundamental and they are truth and they are things that you can depend on regardless of the weather or where you are staying or the background that you may have. Now, the first is the principle of times and seasons. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 that on the fourth day, God created two great lights and put them in the firmament to give light upon the whole of his creation. And he said that these lights will determine the times and the seasons. They will determine day and night. Also, in Genesis chapter 8 verse 22, after Noah came out of the ark and offered a burnt offering unto the Lord that ascended unto him as a sweet smelling fragrance. The Bible says that God smelled that offering and he was pleased with it. And then he declared that seed time and harvest, summer and winter, cold and heat shall never cease as long as the earth abides. There are times and seasons that God has ordained for things. And it is important that you understand this as a citizen of the kingdom of God, that God does his own thing in the time that he has appointed for those things to be done. That is why you cannot rush him and you cannot force him to do something when it is not time for that thing to be done. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 says to everything on earth there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. God has a time that he has appointed for everything and he wants us to know that and align ourselves with him. This is one of the reasons why patience is a major factor for anyone that wants to walk this walk of faith with God. The Bible says that we should be followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promise. Patience implies that there is a time factor and a time 
that is appointed that you have to wait for. There are two things that I strongly believe underlines what is known as the sovereignty of God. His purpose and the time that he has appointed for that purpose to be fulfilled. So God has a purpose that he has ordained that each of his creations would fulfill. There is nothing you can do to alter that because that was the original intention, the original plan of God for making or creating that particular being. And that he has a time that is appointed for that thing to fulfill that purpose. So if you don't understand this, you may run into a whole lot of problems. The Bible says that he that believeth shall not make haste. Because he will understand that there is a time that God has appointed for what he intends to accomplish. In Genesis chapter 3, we saw how men fell in the Garden of Eden and took on the sinful nature. God drove him out of the Garden of Eden. But God did not, because of that, rush to send Jesus Christ as the first one that will be born because he wanted to redeem mankind. No, he had a time in his program that had been appointed for that thing to happen. And one of the things that you will see in the dealings of God is that he likes to create a phenomenon in the world for people to be able to relate with before he releases certain things that he wants to do so that man will be able to understand that which he's doing. For example, God started teaching the children of Israel things that has to do with sacrifice. So they understood that there was an atonement. They understood that there's consecration. They understood that there's sanctification. They understood that there's something called substitution. He taught them using animals. And after they had practiced this for thousands of years and he had become established in their psyche, generation after generation, he now brought Jesus and said he is the lamb that would take away the sin of the world. If he had introduced this to the first set of human beings, they would not have understood what he was doing. Even though he wanted to redeem mankind, and the only way he could redeem mankind is through that redemption work of substitution there is no way man would have been able to connect with it because that concept would have been totally strange to him but he needed time to see to it that men understood what he was doing in shadow and times before he now released the substance to it so time is a very important thing in the dealings of god and if you're going to walk with him, you need to understand that he would always walk with times and seasons for everything that he has appointed. So if God has called you onto a purpose, know that there is a season for that purpose to be fulfilled. Your duty, therefore, is to wait on him and follow him with faith, staying faithful to him and receiving counsel and wisdom from him as he leads you from one stage of life onto another. There are things that God may want to do that would transcend generations. He could begin it with you with the intention of completing it in the fourth generation after you. You need to understand that that is how he deals and you cannot by your fasting and prayer change that fasting and prayer does more to impact and transform us than to shift the position of god in fact god has set things clearly at certain times we are the ones that come into that time and we use fasting and prayer to prepare ourselves to enter into those things so that we can take full advantage of what he is doing when the season of that thing comes but until that season comes, we have the responsibility to wait and be patient. He called Abraham. And for 25 years after he called him, Abraham was waiting on God. God was using that time to build his faith. God was using that time to teach him how to trust in God. And eventually he came to a place where the Bible says that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Initially, 
he was not able to do that because it was the same person that went into Hagar thinking that that was going to be the child of promise. But when he got to a point where he established it in his heart that what God has said, God was going to do it. Then God saw that he was ready and then God implemented what he wanted to do in his life by fulfilling the promise. If God says he's going to bring something glorious out of your life, then you need to understand that it will be done through a process. And that process you will need to submit yourself to it. God revealed unto Joseph that he was going to be a leader through the dreams and the visions that he gave unto him. But it took years, more than 13 years, before that vision would come into reality. God was not in a hurry. God saw everything that his brothers were doing and he worked everything together to fulfill his own agenda for mankind. So, times and seasons are important. It is a key part in this kingdom. It's a fundamental truth in this kingdom. It's a principle that we must learn to abide by. Because when you understand the dealings of God, you'll be able to wait for him. The Bible says that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not go away, and they will walk, and they will not faint. The second principle that is fundamental in the kingdom of God is sowing and reaping. It is a law. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 6, from verse 7 to 9, it says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. He said, whoever sows unto the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that sows unto the spirit will of the spirit reap eternal life. It now says in verse 9, let us therefore not be weary of well-doing. For in due season we will reap if we faint not. You see that due season again? You have to wait until that due season. But while you are waiting... There's something that is expected of you. It is called sowing and reaping. And the Bible tells us two major kinds of sowing within the kingdom of God. There is what is known as sowing unto the flesh. And what you will get from sowing unto the flesh is corruption. Something that is corruptible. If all the investments you are making is one that has to do with this life, then all the rewards you will get will be from this life, from this temporal place. But if you sow it, you will get it. And if you also make investments in that which is eternal, then you can rest assured that there are eternal rewards waiting for you. So while we sowed seeds that are temporal and we want to out of the, those things, into those places that we have sown seeds into, we want to reap a harvest. We want to get ROI, returns on investment here. You must also know that when you make investments in the kingdom of God, in things that pertain to eternal life, there are also rewards waiting for you. There is a reward system in heaven, in the kingdom of God, that is strong. And the way you partake of it is through the principle of sowing and reaping. He says, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 also tells us that he that sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he that sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The measure of your investment is what is going to determine the measure of your returns. That is how these things work. Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measures, pressed down, shaking together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. The next verse, it says, For it is with the same measure that you meet out or that you measure out unto others that it will be measured back unto you. Those are the words, the direct words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is with the same measure that you measure unto others 
that it will be measured back unto you. That's what Apostle Paul was actually emphasizing or reiterating when he said, if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. And if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. So in the kingdom of God, you are expected to sow. To sow. You sow naturally and you sow eternal things. You must be diligent in everything that you are doing. Because this is how God brings reward into people's lives in this kingdom. If you have not sown, you cannot reap. The man of God once said that it is possible for you to reap where you have not sown. But it is not possible for you to reap when you have not sown. I'll repeat that. It is possible for you to reap where you have not sown. Jesus Christ said, he said, I have sent you to go and reap where others have sown. He says, others have labored and you have entered into the arrest. So there are harvests that you will experience that are not directly as a result of what you sowed. But if you have not sown, you cannot enter into anyone's harvest. Not even your own, because after all, you have not sown. So it is a principle. Sowing is crucial in this kingdom. It is a fundamental thing. So ask yourself, what are the things that you are sowing? And come to think of it, whether consciously or unconscious, whether deliberately or otherwise, we are always sowing. It is what we are sowing that will come up for us eventually. When you sow good deeds, you will reap good deeds. When you sow evil deeds, you will most definitely reap evil deeds. It is as simple as that. When you sow righteous things, you will also experience. When you sow in the lives of other people's children, many others will sow into the lives of your children. Their seed may be your own harvest, but that harvest, that seed from them, that is your harvest, will not happen if you have not sown in the first place. So it cuts across every area of life. In the work that God has called us unto, if you have not sown in secret, forget about reaping in the open. Jesus Christ tells us very clearly. He says, your heavenly father which sees in secret will reward you openly. We live in a generation where people only want to sow in public, where they are seen. And the Bible tells us that what they get, the accolade, the acknowledgement from men that they get is all the reward that they're going to get because that is the kind of seed that they sow. But if they want the kind of harvest that would bring glory to God, that they themselves will rejoice in, he said they should sow those kind of seeds in secret. And this kind of seed, of all kinds of giving that the Bible talks about, alms giving, when you are giving to the needy, it tells you to give it in secret. When you are praying, he said you pray it in secret and then God will reward you openly. So these are examples of the seeds that we sow in this kingdom. If you want a harvest in this kingdom, if you want to experience things that would even surpass your imagination, you have the responsibility to sow the seed first and foremost. God will multiply your seed that you have sown as we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 10 and 11. God will multiply the seeds that you have sown. But you have to put the seed first. The Bible says that Isaac sowed in the land and in the same year he reaped a hundredfold. A hundredfold. God multiplied the harvest. But if he had not sown anything in the first place, there would have been nothing for God to multiply. Because a hundred thousand times zero is still going to be zero. So if you are not sowing, then you are not going to receive harvest. That is how it works within this kingdom. The kind of seed that you sow is very important, like I said. Let me give you a very good example using this case of Isaac. When Isaac sowed a seed and reaped a hundredfold within the same year, you need to understand that there are certain seeds that would not be able to bring you a hundredfold within the same year. For example, if you plant a mango fruit, it is impossible for you to reap a hundredfold of that mango seed in one year. 
you would have to wait for a couple of years before that fruit will mature into a tree and then begin to produce fruits. So if you are going to produce harvest of a hundredfold, it begins with you seeking the face of God to know the right kind of seed to sow. Isaac could have sown wheat or corn. Those are things that can bring a hundredfold in one year. Because, for example, if you put one corn seed into the ground, by the time it brings you the harvest within the space of three months, you can be sure that on one corn cup, you can have more than 100 seeds. So a hundredfold is possible, but it begins with you sowing the right kind of seed. And that's how it applies to every area of life. So don't just sow your seeds anyhow. Ask God for wisdom to guide you as you sow your seed in this kingdom so that you can reap a hundredfold. But also, note, the fact that a seed is not bringing you a hundredfold does not mean that it is not right. There are certain seeds that will bring 30. There are those who will bring 60. And there are those who will bring 100, as we saw in the parable of the sower. They are all seeds and they are all products of the blessings of God upon your effort. But that harvest you are going to be getting will depend on the nature of the seed that you are sowing. So God will lead you to sow towards the ones that will produce 30, to sow seeds that will produce 60 and also 100. Just make sure that you are following his leading part time and it will bring you into the harvest that he has prepared for you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last principle that we're going to be looking at is the principle of the purpose and the anointing. The purpose and the anointing. Now, I see a lot of believers make this mistake thinking that when you desire a, a particular kind of anointing, all you need to do is go on lengthy or elongated time of fasting and prayer and then you will get it. That's not how it works. There is a purpose and a design to everything that God does. The kind of anointing that you will get and the way that anointing will operate in your life will be linked directly to the purpose that God wants you to accomplish. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. There is a purpose, and that is what the anointing comes to accomplish. If you do not have a purpose, or, or let me say, if your purpose is different from someone else's, your anointing will be different from that person. The way the Holy Ghost will operate in you, which is what is known as the anointing, will be different from the way it will work in that other person. Take for instance, power is supplied into a building. And the same electricity, when it enters into a TV set, it produces visuals. It produces sound. So you are seeing images and you are also hearing sound. But that same electrical power enters into a radio set and all you hear is sound. That same electrical power enters into a refrigerator or a deep freezer and it produces coldness in different degrees. The same electrical supply enters into an electrical ion and it produces heat. It is the same electricity, but what is coming out of all of these different appliances is dependent on their design, the purpose that they were manufactured to fulfill. It is the same thing that applies to you. The way the anointing will operate in your life will depend on the purpose that God created you to serve, not the one you want to serve. Moses did many miracles, signs and wonders. But there was no record of Moses raising the dead. Because his calling was to bring Israel out of the land of Egypt. If anything, Moses' anointing caused a lot of death and destruction. Because that was attached to the purpose he was called to fulfill. Joshua who Moses laid hands upon, did not do the kind of miracles that Moses did. He did the kind of wonders 
that were in alignment with the purpose that he was called to fulfill and that was to bring israel into the promised land and divide that inheritance unto them so you need to understand the way the anointing will work in your life elisha raised the dead and cleansed lepers like naaman jesus walked in the anointing he raised the dead he did so many things that was in line with the, the purpose that God called him to fulfill. So if the anointing is going to work in you, ask yourself, what is the purpose that God has called you to fulfill? That's what you should channel all your energy and prayers into. Not you wanting to be like someone. Imagine an electrical iron wanting to bring coldness like a deep freezer. It will be operating contrary to its purpose and therefore it will lose its relevance. So what is your purpose? That is how the Holy Spirit is going to find expression through you. It was the anointing of God that was working in Daniel. It was the anointing of God that was working in Solomon, bringing wisdom into operation in their lives. The same anointing was working in Peter, in Paul, but in different dimensions because these ones were to minister the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the principle of purpose and anointing states clearly that the anointing, which is the workings of the Spirit of God in you, will always be in line with the purpose that you have been called to fulfill. So these are the principles that I'm just going to be sharing with us today. When we have time, maybe during when we have a full teaching session, we will delve more into some of these other principles but i believe that this will open your mind to see certain patterns which is really the purpose of this teaching there's no way we can exhaust the bible within this short period of time that we are using to teach this particular course but as you begin to study through the scriptures you will see these patterns in the operations of god and you see how fundamental they are and as you embrace the wisdom behind them you will enjoy rest, peace, and then you'll be able to become all that God has called you to do in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the privilege to receive the wisdom from your word again. Thank you for the supply of the spirit of Jesus. I ask for everyone that has listened to this message that this word will impact their lives, strengthening them in their pursuit of your will for their lives and enable them, oh God, do all that you have called them to do. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. God bless you.